So when I was a little girl, I wanted to be a sunbeam, a doctor, a ballerina, a professional tennis player, and president of the United States. <laughs> and like me, most of us began experimenting with what we wanted to be when we grew up, what we might call our personal mission statement. That began very early in our lives. How many of you remember wanting to be something when you grew up? Okay. So most of us started early together. We called it dreaming. Maybe we called it daydreaming. And kids still dream. According to one survey, children today aspire to be dancers, musicians, teachers, actors, scientists, athletes, detectives, writers, pilots, veterinarians, lawyers, doctors, and like kids of previous generations, police officers, firefighters, and astronauts. The latest comes from my eight-year-old grandson who wants to be a YouTube blogger. <laughs> and I think he calls it a YouTube millionaire. That's his dream. And while children dream of fighting fires or flying to the moon or making millions on YouTube, Businesses, corporations, even the military have been cranking out mission statements for years to help them achieve their goals. So let's see if we can guess um, a couple of the corporations that are behind a couple of these mission statements. So first one, to organize the world's information and to make it universally accessible and useful. Google, right? Okay, try this one prevents and alleviates human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. The American Red Cross. They work, huh? <laughs> this one, to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. Ideas? That's Starbucks. <laughs> that one's Starbucks. So business, business knows the value of a mission statement. And many churches have mission statements as well. Ours here at Desert Skies is based on our vision, which is to be a joyful community, drawing people to Christ. But our mission is to lead our neighbors to Christ love one another in caring community, learn to follow Jesus, and live a Christ-like life that serves the world. And that statement drives all that we do as a church. And I am truly grateful for its guidance and its vision. Now, personal mission statements, they became really popular when Stephen Covey wrote his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And it asked that question, just what is your mission in life? Exactly. What is it that drives you to get up in the morning? What legacy do you want to leave to the world? And those really are key questions that all of us should be asking. Writing down a personal mission statement allows us to put our um, answers in a statement that's short enough that we can use it to explain our whole life to someone we encounter briefly on an elevator. Because, you know, people are always asking our purpose in life whenever we're on an elevator. <laughs> but a personal mission statement is a way of defining yourself and what you're all about. A personal mission statement defi defines your boundaries, clarifying what you are wired to do and unapologetically leaving out the rest. A great example of that is we have this amazing choir. And inevitably, when someone new walks through the door, one of your choir members will go over and invite them to join the choir. It happens a lot. And, the be and, and some people do it, and other people say, oh, you don't want me in the choir. I can't sing. Okay. 
knowing clarity, knowing your boundaries, knowing what you are good at and what you're not. That sharpens your focus when you put it down on paper, guides your decision making, acts sort of as a compass for your life. And in that way, it acts like a filter. You can instantly discern whether that job should be taken or that opportunity seized or that decision made based on your defined purpose for your life. Maybe think of it this way. A personal mission statement is a sort of statement of call. It defines what God has put us on earth to do. In other words, it answers the question, what's your why? Now, the difference between a call and a more conventional personal mission statement is that the latter is something that you generate from within. So a personal mission statement, it comes from your likes and your dislikes, the things that you really enjoy doing that you're good at. But a divine personal mission statement, on the other hand, means that your specific call is also part of God's larger mission for the world. In other words, God provides us with this common mission. As United Methodists, we believe that is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And so then we discover our niche within that larger mission through the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And if we want to know how that works, um, we need look no further than the personal mission statement of Jesus himself. Because Jesus' personal mission statement was embedded in him long before he was ever born in Bethlehem. You see, he came in the flesh to show us how to lead, to love, to learn, and to live as God designed us to do. That included his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection, this pattern this model for living that all of us who follow him will follow as our life as well. And he came to draw all things, all things to God in the spirit of love and grace and compassion as he taught and healed and challenged and called. So Jesus would go from his waters of baptism where his ministry became public his mission starting to bear fruit. And immediately, God sends him into the wilderness where he is to be tempted by Satan to abandon his personal mission statement, to use the powers that are within him, but not to do the things that he was called to do. He was asked by Satan to take this path of expedience. But Jesus would not be deterred. So empowered by the Holy Spirit, galvanized by scriptures, Jesus continued to use his mission statement throughout his life as his guiding compass. So then it becomes no coincidence that after Jesus calls his first disciples, he immediately begins executing that mission and teaches them to do the exact same thing. So we read, he went through Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and sickness among the people. So when we turn to the New Testament lesson from Acts, we see Peter, who after Jesus' death assumes the mantle of leadership in the early church, he has just crossed a huge ethnic and religious boundary to meet with the Gentile Cornelius proclaiming that this new back and forth between Jew and Gentile is the result of the mission that Jesus had given to him and to his fellow disciples. And Peter acknowledges then that that original mission comes from God. And he said, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of just Israel? All. He is Lord of all. And by following Jesus with all of his heart and soul and mind and strength, Peter found his personal mission 
within Jesus's larger mission. And he's described throughout scripture as growing in his understanding of himself, of others, and his community. You see, Peter's initial idea of community, we are Jews, we are the chosen people, we hide ourselves from the rest of the world so that we can be holy. That initial idea of community is completely shattered by a vision from God that he sees three times, where this big sheet is let down from heaven and all the animals he's been to- and reptiles he's been told to avoid for his whole life, God says, Peter, take and eat. And he says, I can't do that, God. That's not what it's all about. That is not what I've been taught my whole life, and I am not going to do it. So God has to tell him two more times um, before Peter realizes that God really does mean for him to eat and partake and break those boundaries that he has always put around himself. So he confronts his fears of the other and envisions this new community based on new criteria, the transformation of all. And a transformed worldview is able to see that the arrival of the other enriches and strengthens one's community. It imagines a different reality in which the arrival of the other adds to the community and makes it complete. A community, you see, it needs the other in order for it to be full and is incomplete without the presence of the other. And in a world that is divided and filled with fear for what tomorrow may bring, there's this still small voice that comes to us saying, God loves us all. And a blueprint for creating that kind of a welcoming community, that kind of a church, that kind of a life, comes from these three rules that John Wesley gave us. Do no harm, do good, and attend to all the ordinances of God, or as Bishop Reuben Job put it in his book, Three Simple Rules, and as we shared with the children, stay in love with God. So the Methodist movement began not just with passionate, personal encounters of God, and God's presence, but with this desire to actually live holy lives shaped by God's covenant with us. So as we saw in the video, John Wesley noted that some of the early Methodist societies were becoming more lax in their expectations for holy living. So he gave them these very specific general rules because Wesley believed that they were applications of scriptural holiness in his people's context. And Methodists have been redefining that for their context in all the years subsequent to Wesley's giving them. It was intended to teach people that theology had practical implications in the way that they lived their lives. So back in the day, in the 1800s, anyone who consistently failed to check off enough of these rules would be asked to leave the Methodist societies until they were ready to take it more seriously. I mean, can you imagine us doing that today? (laughs) Probably not. So do no harm. That's a pretty generic bumper sticker sort of Christianity. But in Wesley societies, it meant no buying or selling of slaves. That was before abolition was even a concept. It meant No conversations that are meant to tear others down. I love this. Including the way we talk about our politicians. And it meant asking one another very personal things like, have you been buying luxuries for yourself instead of helping the poor? Now, do good got into the incredibly specific questions of, How have you shown mercy to the bodies and souls of the poor? And you had to go around at your small group meeting each week and tell each other what you had done to help the bodies and the souls of the poor that you encountered around you. And remember from last week, most of these people were people generated from that open air field preaching. They were all poor. And so what are you doing to help others 
in their lives. Now, attending upon all the ordinances of God was Wesley's very peculiar way of saying, practice the means of grace. And those are specific practices that God has ordained for us to experience grace, such as corporate worship, taking the sacraments, prayer, scripture study, and fasting. All of those things that help us to stay in love with God. And following these three general rules is a method for discovering not only your own personal mission statement, but the mission statement of your faith community in the world in which you live and work and worship. And it's interesting to notice how the mission gets transferred. It comes from God, who has this incredible mission of transforming the whole world um, through the Word made flesh, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. And then it goes from Jesus through the Holy Spirit to the disciples. And then finally, it goes from the disciples via the Holy Spirit, via, in our case, from the practice of the three general rules, to you. And that discovery is unique to every single one of you. There's an old story of the 19th century British scientist Thomas Huxley, who got off the train one day at the Dublin station. He was late for a very important meeting of a scholarly society. So jumping into the nearest cab, he ordered the coachman, drive fast. And with a crack of the whip, the horse was off and running, pulling the cab at a furious pace. And Huxley called to the driver, do you know where you're going? And the coachman answered with a grin, no, I don't know where we're going, but I'm driving fast. And that's a pretty accurate picture of the way many of us live our days. We drive fast, even though we may not really know where we're going. So to avoid that lack of purpose and spinning our wheels and driving so fast that we're exhausted and we're never sure when we arrive, we sort of need a personal mission statement to tell us where we ought to be going. We have our general orders from God through Jesus, through the disciples, but each of us has to discover our own particular calling, our own personal mission within the bigger mission of God. The three general rules, they are a gift that Methodism brings to the conversation of discovery. What's your why? So let's find out. Let's Let's discover our mission together. Let's have clarity about who we are and what God calls us to do with our unique abilities. And let's live it out then as we covenant together to do no harm, to do good, and to stay in love with God as we live together in this community that we call Desert Skies United Methodist Church. Today, we will begin with a recommitment of our lives through the reaffirmation of our baptism and a declaration of our mission to follow God. You know, many of us were baptized as babies, and we don't really remember that vow being made on our behalf, even though stories of it um, come through in our life. So every year that I've been here, so this is year the fifth year, We've done a reaffirmation of our baptism on the baptism of the Lord's Sunday. Um, this year, because there are a lot of um, interesting germs floating around, um, instead of having you all play with the water in whatever way you like, um, Fred and I will be um, just making the sign of the cross on your forehead with the water, and we promise we'll sanitize our hands before we do that. Um, some of you might not be baptized yet, and yet you are still welcome to come forward and recommit your lives to whatever place you are in your life. Um, we would just ask that if you do that, just hold out your hand, and we will give you a different blessing than remember your baptism. Um, and so uh, we will be entering that after our time of prayer, but wanted to just give a little bit of background as to why we reaffirm our baptism so that we can remember we can remember what Jesus brought to us and that we are specially called to take that message out into the world. I invite us now to our time of prayer.